Hi, welcome. Have you heard the words cash burn? I keep reading it in the context of young companies that are losing money and how much cash they're burning through. And I'll be quite honest, when I hear the words, I have visions of founders and VCs going into their backyards, creating a big pile of cash and setting it on fire. Maybe that's not that far from the truth. So I thought I'd use this session to explore what exactly cash burn is, why it happens, and what to do about it, as, both as an investor and in valuation. So let's get the process rolling by first looking at cash. I mean, notice the words are cash burn, not earnings burn. And while people loosely talk about money losing companies burning through cash, it's really cash flow base, not earnings base. So the first step in understanding cash burn is coming up with a working definition of cash flow. And as somebody who works with cash flows and valuation, I went to the, play, to, to the definition that I'm most comfortable with, which is free cash flow to the firm. This is the cash flow you discount to value a business. It's free because it's after taxes and after reinvestment needs. And it's, here's how it's computed. You start with the after-tax operating income of the company, not the net income, but the after-tax operating income. You subtract out what you reinvest for future growth. And you break that reinvestment down into reinvestment in long-term assets, usually measured as the difference between capex and depreciation, and reinvestment in short-term assets. And what you're left with is the free cash flow to the firm. For a healthy, mature firm, this should be a positive number because you start with positive earnings. And even after you've reinvested to cover future growth, there should be cash left over. That positive free cash flow is what you use to service debt payments, interest and principal payments, as well as pay dividends and buy back stock. And if there's any cash left over, it of course augments your cash balance. So that's free cash flow to the firm. And that is the start of our discussion of cash burn because the question you got to start off with is, can that free cash flow be a negative number? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, of course. It can be a negative number because you start off with a loss. And then if you have lo lots of growth potential, you reinvest on top of that loss. You have a negative number with another negative number. Your free cash flow, of course, will become a big negative number. That negative free cash flow to the firm as you can't return it because obviously it's negative, it has to be covered from somewhere. The first place you'll probably look is your existing cash balance and you draw it down. If that's not enough, then you have to raise external capital. From where? You either have to borrow money or raise new equity. If these losses you're making are continuous over time, well, nobody's going to lend you money, so you'll have to use new equity to cover those negative free cash flow. So your free cash flow to the firm can be negative, and this can, ha can happen to any firm, including a mature, healthy firm in a bad year. But what if you're in a scenario where this free cash flow to the firm is negative year after year after year, not, just, not because you're a terrible firm, but because of where you are in the life cycle? That is the basis for cash burn. So when you start thinking about cash burn, the first question you ask is, how do I measure this cash burn? There are two ways it's measured. One is as a dollar value. The amount of cash you burn through in a week, a month, or a year. So it's usually a, a temporal measure of cash, of cash burn. And it's usually computed by taking the starting cash balance you had as a company, taking the ending cash balance at the end of the period, and then dividing by the number of weeks or months you have in the period. So as an example, you start off the year with a billion dollars in cash, you end the year with 400 million in cash, and you have 12 months, your cash burn is about 50 million a month. This, of course, works only if no new capital is being raised during the course of the year. So be careful about the shortcut. But that is one way in which people measure cash burn is as a dollar value per month or year. The other way people measure the extent of cash burn is what's called a cash runway. You think, what the heck is a cash runway? Let's take the example we just completed. Your cash burn is about 50 million a year, right? You got $400 million left over now as a cash balance. You got about eight months of cash before you run out of cash. That's called the cash runway. Why is it used? The longer your cash run away, the more time you have before you run out of cash, the safer in a sense you are as a company because you don't have to go to capital markets. So we have a sense of what drives cash burn and how to measure it. Let's think about why it happens. Perhaps the best way of thinking about why cash burn happens is to think in terms of a life cycle. And I'm going to first present you with a benign picture of cash burn. Benign in what sense? This is what you'd expect a healthy going concern to look like as it moves through the life cycle. Early in the life cycle, you're a startup firm. You have very little in revenues, if not, perhaps nothing. You're making losses and you're reinvesting because all your future is in growth. You're going to have big negative cash flows. 
as you go into the young growth phase, you're still losing money probably because you're getting established in your business. You're reinvesting large amounts. Still, your free cash flow is probably going to get even more negative because you're reinvesting more. So your free cash flow stays negative. Then you get to be a growth company. You're, you're starting to get some roots in your business. You're starting to sell more, perhaps get some pricing power. Your margins get less negative. You're still reinvesting, so your cash flows stay negative, even after your margins stay positive. But at some point in time, as your growth starts to scale down, you get a glimmer of positive free cash flow. Then you get to be a growth firm. Your earnings continue to go up because you're a growth firm. You're starting to reinvest less and less because your future-looking growth starts to decrease. Your investment opportunities decrease, so your free cash flow to the firm actually grows faster than your operating income. And then you get to be a mature firm, and both your cash flow and your earnings start to grow at a kind of mid, mid-level mid rate, maybe the growth rate of the economy. But you're harvesting your spoils from all the good stuff you did in the past. Then you get to be a declining firm. Your revenues might start to level off, perhaps even drop. Your margins start shrinking. You start divesting businesses rather than reinvesting them. So that creates a cash inflow every time you divest a business. Your cash flows might stay positive, but they're starting to decrease from your stable growth phase. So if you look at the bottom of this page, you actually see the picture of a free cash flow of the firm for a company that's a healthy company that grows through the life cycle. So you're saying, so what? So cash burn is always good? Well, cash burn can be good, bad, or neutral. And so I'd like to talk about when cash burn can be benign and what it looks like when it's malignant. So let's start with the benign example, which I just described with that life cycle. In fact, here I'm going to be specific. I'm going to use my valuation of Uber in August of 2016, which was a pretty optimistic, benign valuation, a valuation where I assume that Uber is going to grow, become more profitable, a successful firm over time, and show you what cash flows look like when you assume when you assume health. This basically projects out four numbers for Uber each year. It projects out the revenues, and you can see revenues kind of exploding over time. It projects out operating income, initially a loss because Uber's you know, operating margins are negative, but over time the margin improves because of economies of scale as, as, as you scale up. And in year six, Uber starts to make money. It starts to generate profits. It shows you reinvestment, which continues to be high all through the life because, you know, as you're growing, you've got to set aside money to cover growth. But it, that reinvestment is now getting to be a smaller and smaller percentage of the firm as you get to year five, year six, year seven, year eight, year nine, and year ten. And then it shows you cash flow. So here's what's happening. Your small revenues become big revenues. Your losses become profits as you move from negative margins to a target margin of 20%. Your reinvestment is a number that drains your cash flows, but it's a smaller and smaller percentage of your firm as you get larger. So the combination of less reinvestment, more operating income creates positive cash flows at some point in time. In the case of Uber, in this optimistic valuation, my free cash flow to the firm doesn't quite turn the corner until you're after your seven. I have cash burn for the next seven years of more than seven, six and a half to seven billion dollars because Uber, not because Uber is doing bad things, but because that's what Uber has to set aside to grow and to cover its initial growing pains. This is a benign picture of cash burn. You see, what will a malignant picture look like? Let me take the Uber valuation and change two inputs. One is, instead of having the target margin be 20%, let's assume it converges at 5%. I'm assuming the ride-sharing business or whatever business Uber is in is, becomes cutthroat competition. And price, so there's no, pricing, there's no pricing power and costs continue to go up. So 5% margin. So what happens here? I lose money for a longer period. And when I do make money, I make less money than I did in the previous scenario. I also am going to assume that Uber will have to reinvest more like a typical U.S. firm. In my benign scenario, Uber, for every dollar they invested, got $3 in revenues. Here, I'm going to assume they get only $2 in revenues. So they have to reinvest more to get the same revenues. Their reinvestment becomes a bigger number. You combine less operating income with more reinvestment, you have more negative free, ca- free cash flows. In fact, in this malignant scenario, my free cash flows never turn positive. In fact, if this unfolded, Uber would not make it to year 10. Capital providers would probably get tired in year 2 or 3 or 4, and the company would cease to exist. So good things can happen with cash burn, but bad things can happen with cash burn as well. And I think these two scenarios kind of illustrate the contrast. At this stage, as investors, you're saying, so what? 
So what if there's cash burn? There are two ways cash burn affects you as an investor. The first is when you have negative cash flows, which is what creates the cash burn, you've got to come up with external capital to cover that, those negative cash flows, right? And as I said, if you're a young company, that negative cash flow, that, that capital has to come mostly from equity. You, that, that equity. Those investors supply equity are going to get a piece of your company. So the way to think about cash burn is if you're invested in a company with cash burn, even in the benign scenario, you will have to give up a piece of the company to cover the cash burn, which means by the end of year eight or year 10, when the company becomes a solid, profitable company, you will own less of the company than you otherwise would have without the cash burn. That's a dilution effect. The second is the capital markets effect. What am I talking about? Well, you've got to raise capital to cover those cash flows. I'm implicitly assuming that capital markets are open and accessible. But what if that's not true? What if it's 2001 after the dot-com bust or 2009 after the banking crisis? Or in general, if you look across even the even market like the U.S., which is perhaps the most liquid private capital in the world, you've had periods of history where venture capitalists pull back from the table and public markets have shut down. And outside the U.S., this is common. If capital dries up, here's your best case scenario as a company. You cut back on your discretionary cash flow, the CapEx, the, and you will survive. But at, at what cost? Well, you have to accept less growth. So the first effect of capital markets drying up is your high growth company might suddenly become a low growth company, but it survives. That's your best case scenario. The worst case scenario is capital markets dry up. You cut back on your capex or your reinvestment, which is discretionary, but you're still underwater. The game's over, right? These are the companies that go out of business. You've got to liquidate yourself, and you're never going to get fair value when you do this, so that's a distress effect. Now, where does this show up in valuation? If you're doing intrinsic valuation, I know exactly where it shows up. Your negative cash flows, the source of your cash burn, puts a damper on, your, on the value today. In other words, the present value of your negative cash flows will lower the value of your company today. You're, in effect, bringing in the dilution effect into your value today. The capital market effect, you've got to work a little harder to show. One is you can put a cap on how much new capital your company will be able to raise, maybe as a, as a way of kind of keeping a constraint on being too dependent on capital markets. If you do that, then you also have to lower your growth rate. So that's the first way to do it. The second, and this is something I've increasingly taken to doing in my valuations, is to ask a post-valuation question, which is, what is the probability that my company will not make it? And what will happen if it doesn't? You'll notice this in all my DCF valuation spreadsheets. And with a company with a, with a large cash burn, I might attach a significant probability that the company will not make it, which in effect will lower the expected value that I'm willing to pay for the company today. So in the context of Uber again, here's how it played out. When I just discounted the cash flows from years 8 through 10, which were the positive cash flows in the terminal value back for Uber, the value that I got was $25.4 billion. That's not bad. But then I took the first seven years, those negative cash flows, the cash burn por portion of the, of the program, and I discounted those back, and I got $4.4 billion. You see, the value that you will see me reporting for the operating assets at Uber, the $21 billion, is actually the $25.4 minus the $4.4 billion. So the way to think about this is I've discounted my value for Uber by 20% to reflect those expected negative cash flows. I've already built in the dilution effect into my intrinsic value. So I don't have to adjust for that dilution separately. In fact, if I did that, I would actually double count. So if you're doing a DCF and you do it right with the negative cash flows left in there and discounted, you are already home free in terms of dealing with dilution. Now, if I, in the case of Uber, I assume that they're large enough and they have enough capital providers that their chance of a catastrophic failure was zero. I might be too optimistic on this, but let's say you disagreed with me on this. Let's assume that you believe there's a 10% chance that Uber will not make it. And if it doesn't make it, let's assume that the value of the equity is zero because there's not much left to liquidate. If that's the case, you would adjust the $21 billion for the 90% chance of survival, which will give you about $18.9 billion. That's it. You're done. You've adjusted for dilution, the capital market effects. So in intrinsic valuation, it's clear where the cash burn shows up. You're saying, what if I'm doing pricing? Well, then it gets a trickier. You're saying, what are you talking about when you talk about pricing? Most young companies, when you think about how investors and founders put a number on them, here's what they do. They project out a number for the company, earnings, revenues, some, some operating metric out five years or 10 years. They apply a multiple to that number. So let's take an example. Let's suppose you have a young company that right now, 
is losing money, is burning through cash, but you expect it in five years to have 50 million in earnings. And you believe that companies of this type traded 20 times earnings. Where did you get that? Where did you get that? You probably looked at publicly traded companies in this space. 20 times 50 is a billion dollars. That is your estimated exit price for the company. You're almost home, but here's one final adjustment you've got to make. That billion gets discounted back to today. At what rate? At a target rate of return. What's a target rate of return? It's a return that you made up as a VC. You tell me you need to make 40, 50, 60 percent. Why so high? We'll come back in a minute to see why so high. You discount them back to today. You get a value today. That's pricing. It's a price today, not a value today. You think, where in this process would I show my cash burn concerns? Well, you could try to show it in your forward earnings and multiple, right? You can say, I'm going to use a lower earnings and a lower multiple for companies with lots of cash burn. That's really tough to do. You're haircutting those numbers. You have no idea what to do or how to do it. So most people don't do it in, in that place. So the only place you've left for the adjustment is in your target rate of return. Now do you see why it's 40, 50, or 60% in the hands of VCs? This target rate of return is not a discount rate in the conventional sense of the word. It's a rate of return that you use as your kind of receptacle for everything that scares you about the company. And one of the things that scares you about this company might be its high cash burn. And you say, well, I think because it is a lot of cash burn, I'm going to use a 60% target rate rather than a 50%. The problem with these, these rough rules of thumb is that they're rough rules of thumb. In fact, if you wanted to do this right, even in a pricing context, you should be estimating the cash flows for the next three or four or five years. And if they're negative, you should be adjusting your exit price for those negative cash flows, but people don't want to go down that road because the reason you use pricing is because you don't want to estimate the cash flows. So in pricing, I would stop and ask, where's the cash burn built in? Because it might be built in, it might not be built in. And if it's being built in in an arbitrary or a, non, or a way that doesn't vary across companies, you might find yourself over-investing in companies with high cash burn and under-investing in companies with low cash burn. So take a look. Which brings me to the question of what do you as an investor want to see in a company with cash burn? Assume you're interested in investing in a company with cash burn. Here are, here's the checklist I would go through. First, understand why the company is burning through cash. Remember that you know it's a combination of losses and reinvestment that drive cash flows. Your best case scenario is actually a company that's making money but has cash burn because it's reinvesting huge amounts. Why is this the best case? Because your operating business is already showing promise as a profitable business and the reinvestment is discretionary and comes with a payoff. The payoff part is higher growth. The discretionary part helps you. If capital markets shut down, you can still survive. Your most malignant scenario is a company that has negative cash flows because it's losing tons on its operations. There's no pricing, it's selling stuff at below cost. It's not reinvesting very much. There's no growth payoff. And if capital markets shut down, this company will have to shut down as well. You have to diagnose the underlying business. I mean, you want to be in a healthy business, a business where your pricing power and where the costs kind of scale down as you become larger. That's your best case scenario. Because there, as the company gets larger, its operating business is going to throw off profits, which kind of help in bringing your cash flows from negative to positive territory. Your more malignant scenario is a company is a business where there's no pricing power and a cost structure that's out of control. You want to gauge management skills because if you're the manager of a company with a cash burn problem, you've got to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Be able to think about the short term because you've got to manage the cash flow problem in the short term while also keeping your eye on the long term. That it was able to deal with cash flow problems today while also making plans to build up competitive advantages in the long term. So management probably matters more in a cash burn scenario than it than in a scenario where there's no cash burn. Your worst case scenario is a management that is completely unaware of the fact that cash burn is not a good thing, but you know, but it views it as a good thing. So they actually boast about how much cash they can burn through as if this is a badge of honor. Your fourth checkoff, uh, item on the checkoff list, you want to check to see that that reinvestment you're setting aside that's creating a negative cash flow is creating good growth rather than bad growth. You're saying, what do you mean good growth? Good growth is growth where you come, what comes with profits and returns that exceed your cost of investing in those businesses. Lots of companies grow and destroy value at the same time, so you want to make sure your reinvestment trade-off is working in your favor. And finally, you want to check to see how dependent your company is on capital markets. There's a reason why we feel more secure with a company that already has a big cash balance because it doesn't have to go to the market for the next two, three, four, or five years. So the more you have to go back to the market, 
the more worried I'm going to get about your company. So look to see whether your company has a big cash balance or a list of capital providers who will provide it with capital in future years. That should make you feel a lot better about the cash burn. So there's good cash burn companies and bad ones. And in a sense, that's my bottom line. Because I think both ends of the spectrum of people who look at cash burn, I think, are wrong. To those value investors who view cash burn as a horrible thing, as a sign of a debt spiral, I say, let it go. Some of your greatest, most profitable companies of today at some point in their life cycle had a cash burn problem. And if you'd invested in them at the, when they had a cash burn problem, you'd, have, you'd be rich today. So don't automatically reject an investment just because it is a cash burn problem. To those at the other end of the spectrum, VCs and founders who boast about how much cash they can burn, please stop. Burning through cash is not a virtue. Burning through cash with an end game in place where you can show me that that end game makes up for the cash burn is good. So focus less on how much cash you can burn and focus more on what that cash burn can accomplish. And maybe you, you'll get me on as an investor. So if the next time you hear the words cash burn, I hope I provided you some nuance that you can use to decide whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Thank you very much for listening.